viewers. The next lecture is some context structure. Thank you, thank you. So um, <coughs> that's right. So the, the lecture series is going to be on, um, on contact geometry. And so let me just spend the first couple of minutes kind of trying to tell you what I'd like to do over these next uh, five, five talks. Um, <coughs> One nice thing about uh, contact geometry, especially in low dimensions, is that there's a really nice mix of kind of topology, geometry, dynamics, analysis. You kind of get a little mix of everything, a lot of different ways to study um, contact structures. Um, and in these lectures, I hope to give an indication of that. In the first three lectures, I'm going to talk about um, Giroux's <laughs> relation between contact geometry and open books. Well, I'm going to talk about that in dimension three. He has a much more general uh, theory in higher dimensions as well, but the connection with topology is most striking in dimension three. So I'll uh, describe this theorem for you and we'll, we'll sketch a proof and we'll see some applications of it. Um, <clears throat> there's lots of applications of this, this uh, open book theory to understanding uh, properties of contact structures. Also, uh, there's topological applications as well, which we might hear about um, in some other talks. Then in the last two lectures, I want to um, describe uh, Eliasberg and Hofer's uh, contact homology. Um, actually, so this is, this is um, probably many people have heard about it, a very, um, it's a great new invariant of contact structures and also of you know, kind of submanifolds of the contact structures, Legendrian submanifolds in particular. So um, I'm only going to talk about a very special case of this that I know a little bit better than the general theory, um, but that very special case is actually good enough to have some really interesting topological applications. So in the last two lectures, I hope to describe this contact homology and also describe some of the applications to topology. Um, <clears throat> well, so as I said, these first three lectures are going to be the relationship with contact structures and open books. So kind of the first part of the lecture series is contact structures. And open books. And so let me just start out by telling you the main theorem that we're going to be aiming for. So let M be an oriented three manifold, uh, oriented closed three manifold. Uh, then there is a one to one correspondence. between uh, uh, oriented contact structures uh, up to isotopy and uh, open books for M up to positive Stabilization. Let me read this. So I don't necessarily expect that these words actually to, uh, hopefully some of the words make some sense, but um, I don't expect you to kind of uh, know all the words. And in fact, today what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend my time over here talking about this. This is a purely topological concept, uh, open books for three manifolds have been studied um, by topologists for quite some time, um, maybe a century, maybe a little bit less than that. Um, <clears throat> but this idea of positive stabilization is the thing that gives you the connection to the contact geometry. So I'm going to kind of describe uh, this side of the story today. Tomorrow we'll bring in the contact structures and we'll start to try to prove this correspondence. And then maybe on Wednesday we'll try to look at some applications of the theorem um, to studying some uh, fillability properties and some other things about contact structures. Okay. So again, today, we're going to be talking about open book decompositions. So throughout today and probably throughout the entire uh, lecture series, uh, M uh, is a closed oriented uh, three manifold. 
So let's just get started with the definition of open book. So an open book decomposition of M is a pair uh, B pi uh, such that or where one uh, B is an oriented link in M uh, and it's called the binding And two, uh, pi is a map from M minus B, so you should move B from M uh, to S1, and it happens to be a vibration. So it is a vibration. You actually need a little bit more than this. Um, so it's a vibration such that pi inverse of theta, so theta is just a coordinate on the, uh, just a point on S1, um, is, uh, the interior of a compact surface which I'll denote uh, sigma sub theta uh, such that the boundary of sigma theta is equal to b. Okay? So we want each of the, uh, we want each of the uh, surfaces, each of the fibers in the vibration to actually um, have boundary B. So it's kind of like a ciphered surface for this, uh, for this link. So I'd like to point out, um, just because when I've had discussions with kind of topologists that work on fibered knots, um, we spent hours in confusion on this issue. Uh, sometimes when people study um, open book, well not open books, but when they study something called a fibered link, which, is very, which has a definition very similar to this, um, they actually don't require that the fibers um, have boundary equal to B. They could have the, 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 the fibers could actually kind of come in ridenly to the, to the knot. Um, so I don't want to consider that case. That's not what shows up for open books. Um, but again, this is kind of a confusion, confusion and this is kind of the distinction between maybe open books and fibered knots. Um, although some people use this definition for fibered knots as well. So just have to make sure and get your definition straight when, when talking with people on this issue. Okay. Um, oh, I guess I should also say um, the sigma sub theta. So, so sigma theta is called a page of the open book. All right. So. This is the uh, thing of prime interest to us, but I'd like to kind of point out, give maybe a slightly different uh, definition. Some people call it an equivalent definition, but they're actually slightly different. So um, an abstract open book is a pair sigma phi where one uh, sigma is an oriented uh, compact surface and two uh, phi from sigma to sigma is a diffeomorphism Such, uh, such that a phi restricted to a neighborhood of the boundary of sigma is the identity on that neighborhood, okay? So there's diffeomorphisms that are identity in the neighborhood of the boundary. Um, and phi is called the monodromy. So phi is called the monodromy. Of the open book. So the first thing, of course, is I've given you two definitions here. We'd like to see the relation between them. I'm sure a lot of people know immediately what the relationship is. But in working out this relationship, it'll really help us understand what an open book kind of looks like or the way to think about it and study it. So um, let me just kind of note. So given sigma phi, uh, we get 
a three manifold, which I'll denote sigma sub, uh, sorry, m sub sigma phi. So there's a three manifold associated with this abstract open book, um, and the construction is very simple. Um, it's just simply the following. Um, I get my notation right. So you just take the mapping torus of uh, phi, so that's this thing, you take sigma cross zero one and you identify sigma cross zero with sigma cross one using the diffeomorphism. Okay, so this is of course frequently called the mapping torus of, of phi and I'll denote this sigma sub phi when I want to talk about it kind of separately. <coughs> So this doesn't give you a closed three manifold because of course the surface had boundary. Um, so, and since phi is identity near the boundary, you're gonna have a bunch of tori in the boundary of this uh, mapping torus. So you wanna actually kind of then glue on. So you're gonna take the disjoint union of a bunch of copies of solid tori, S1 cross D2s, um, and the number you take is just the number, number of boundary components of, uh, of sigma. So the absolute values here just mean the, the, number, of bound, uh, the number of components of that set. <laughs> okay. So how are we supposed to glue these together? So this map psi is what's going to uh, glue these things together. And uh, so, so where for each psi, uh, sorry, for each, uh, each boundary component, uh, uh, sigma we have the following picture. So uh, you're going to have an S1 cross D2, um, which I'll write like this. And in S1 cross D2, of course, you've got this kind of meridional disk. You've got this, uh, this red curve mu, which bounds a disk inside of S1 cross D2, and then you've got um, a point in the D2 cross S1, which I'll call lambda. And now over here you've got, uh, you've got the boundary of sigma phi, and you're looking at the particular, uh, a particular boundary component of sigma, so that corresponds to a particular boundary component of this mapping torus, and it will look like this. So, um, let's see. So there's, you know, say sigma cross a point coming in and uh, its boundary I'll denote L. And then if you take a point on the boundary of sigma and you cross it with, uh, with the interval in the mapping torus, it's going to give you a curve that I'll call M. And phi is simply a map that identifies, so phi, there's a unique phi up to isotopy such that phi of lambda equals L and phi of mu equals m, okay? And we use this map to glue in the solid tori. So you can see what's happening is as you go around this circle, you've got a bunch of uh, these sigma cross points that go around and their boundaries kind of go to these lambdas, which you can kind of think about uh, kind of coning in to the core. So this core torus is a, is a the, the core of each of these tori, if we take the union of them, will give me a link in the manifold whose complement is fibered, okay? So again, the goal for today before I erase it is to kind of understand this. So open books and this positive stabilization concept. So the right-hand side of this uh, <coughs> correspondence of Giroux. Excuse me? Uh, swap? Ah, yes. Okay, so we need one more definition before we can um, state uh, kind of a, a lemma that relates these two uh, types of open books, the abstract open book and the, the other one. So uh, two uh, abstract open books. Uh, sigma i phi i for i equals zero one are equivalent if there exists a diffeomorphism uh, 
h from sigma 0 to sigma 1 uh, such that uh, h composed with phi 1 is equal to uh, phi 0 composed with h. So basically, just commuting with the monodromy maps. And now we can state uh, a lemma. So maybe I'll give it a number if I have to refer back to it later on. Um, so the first part of the lemma says um, an open book decomposition B pi. So remember, this is the original definition of open book. We have the binding and the projection map of M gives an abstract open book, which I'll denote uh, sigma pi phi pi. Okay, so the surface is de de determined by pi and also the monodrum is going to be determined by the projection map, um, such that uh, M sigma pi phi pi is diffeomorphic to M. Okay, so this is uh, a fairly straightforward uh, thing to prove. So an abstract open book uh, determines, well, I guess I'll give it a name, uh, sigma phi determines B, maybe I'll put a sigma phi there. So this B, of course, is just the, the cores of all these tori that I glue in. So it determines a, a, a manifold and a link. Um, it's an abstract open book, determines this uh, up to diffeomorphism. And of course, this is just my um, definition of an open book. So the abstract open book determines an open book. The open book determines an abstract open book. And finally, uh, equivalent uh, abstract open books uh, determine or give diffeomorphic uh, three manifolds. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the little lemma and I'm just going to leave as an exercise to prove this. Okay, so I'm not going to bother to prove it, but essentially the construction I wrote down there, if you think about it a little bit, is enough to kind of uh, prove this, this lemma. And uh, this lemma, as you go through, is, you know, if you work this exercise, this will help you really understand what, what open books are. Another way to understand what open books are is to actually look at some specific examples. So let me give you a few explicit examples. So uh, let S3 equal the unit uh, three sphere. in C2, which you can think of as R4 if you like. Um, we'll use coordinates on C2, uh, Z1, Z2, or sometimes I'll use polar coordinates R1, E to the I, theta 1, and R2, E to the I, theta 2. Just sometimes those are going to be useful. And now the first example I want to give you is uh, if we let U equal the set of points Z1 equals 0, intersect S3, of course this is a subset of S3, um, and this is just, uh, uh, so U is the unknot in S3. And if you look at the map pi U um, from S3 minus U to S1, just given by sending Z1, Z2, to Z1 over the absolute value of Z1, uh, this turns out to be a vibration of the complement. So you have a very explicit map for it. Um, right. uh, I 
shouldn't have done that, right? That was. Okay, so I won't draw the picture um, that corresponds to this, but it's fairly easy to draw. It's just the fact that, of course, S3 can be represented as the union of two solid tori. One of them is a the neighborhood of the unknot, and the other one is the complement. And of course, a solid tori is just a vibration that can be fibered by, uh, by disks. So it's a very simple picture there. A slightly more interesting picture that's actually going to show up uh, several times for us later on is, well, H plus, which is going to be the set of uh, points Z1, Z2 in S3 such that uh, Z1 times Z2 equals 0. And we'll also have H minus, which is the set of points Z1, Z2 in S3, such that Z1, Z2 bar is equal to 0. So these, are, these give uh, two uh, links in, uh, in S3. And maybe I should say, um, well, first let me then give the vibrations, I guess, uh, pi plus is going to be a map from S3 minus H plus um, to S1, and it's given by uh, Z1, Z2, uh, maps to uh, Z1 times Z2 over Z1, Z2 in absolute value. Um, and pi plus, or sorry, pi minus. So just copy that line again until you get to here. And you'll have Z1, Z2 bar oops, over Z1, Z2 bar absolute value. Okay. Um, and I claim that these are vibrations of the complement of those links. And the exercise here, uh, picture uh, H plus minus and the vibrations. I'm sure a lot of people have probably already figured out what H plus and minus are, but these are just the hop links, the positive and negative hop links. So the picture is this. So you might think it's a little strange that this is going to be H plus, um, that H plus has the left-handed twist in it, but that's just kind of the way it works out. Um, and I put orientation on here because uh, you're supposed to be looking at oriented links, if you recall the definition. And the orientation comes from the fact that, of course, this is just the, you can think of it as the boundary of a hypersurface um, in, in uh, C2. And then uh, H H minus is just the thing with the other class. And, uh, <coughs> The, the exercise here, while I've given you what the, what the knots are, is actually picture this vibration in S3. Um, it's not too terribly hard to do and, and quite interesting. Well, so after seeing these examples, there's kind of an obvious way to generalize what's going on here. Um, so let me just give you one more example that's actually an infinite number of examples. Um, so more generally. Let F from C2 to C be a polynomial uh, that vanishes at 0, 0. Uh, and uh, has no critical points inside uh, S3 except possibly uh, 0, 0. So 0, 0 could be at a, a critical point, but everything else has to be um, non-critical. Uh, now we can uh, define the knot, so we can let k equal f inverse of 0. It's a knot or a link, actually. It doesn't have to be a knot. Um, so this is something sitting inside of S3. Well, sorry. Do you mean no critical points inside B4? Uh, well, in, by inside of... Yeah. Uh, B4. Right. Yeah. By inside, I kind of meant it was dividing. But yeah. Uh, this intersect S3. Sitting in S3. So this is some link. And the complement, there's a vibration on the complement. Uh,
And again, if you look at these examples, you can kind of get an idea of what that should be. Um, I'm simply going to take f evaluated at z1, z2, uh, divided by the absolute value of f, z1, z2. Okay. And of course, this makes sense because I kind of removed the places where it's zero, so this actually is a nice map. And of course, as I'm dividing out by the, the, the size of f, you actually do get a map to S1. You can think of it as a unit S1 in, um, in, in C. In C. Um, and the claim is this is a fibration. This is called the Milner fibration of this knot. So Milner was kind of the one that really kind of studied this and studied much more general situations as well. Um, <clears throat> But all these other things are special, exam- special cases of, of this construction here. Well, I guess actually H minus isn't, right? Because I didn't take a, um, normally polynomials, you don't like to put bars in them, but you actually allow those as well if you'd like. Okay, so those are all the explicit examples I'm going to give, but let me give you one more exercise. It'll help you also understand these a little bit more. So let, boy, not having much luck with this chalk. Let um, sigma equal uh, be a surface of genus G with n boundary components uh, phi from sigma to sigma be the identity uh, what is m sigma phi Okay, so what manifold do you get when you just uh, take the identity map on a surface of genus G with inboundary components? Okay. Maybe uh, before I move on, um, I-, I would like to make one more comment about why I gave these two different definitions. You might think it was just being a little bit pedantic or something, giving two definitions of these open books, this abstract open book and kind of the open book sitting inside of the manifold, kind of an ambient open book. So why, why bother with these two definitions? Well, one thing I, help, I think it helps clarify what's going on. And secondly, the ambient open book, you have this, this, this link inside the manifold, and you can study that link up to isotopy. When you have an abstract open book, you can only study things up to diffeomorphism, not isotopy of the manifold. And those are two different things. So actually, these ambient open books are actually um, a little bit more uh, subtle. I mean, there, there's, there's kind of more to them. Um, you, can, you can study them up to isotopy, which is, again, a finer, a finer thing. I mean, we're going to see actually later on that th- this distinction is important when studying the contact structures as well. Okay. <coughs> so now we come to the first kind of main theorem uh, that I want to talk about, and that's uh, it's a theorem. Two, um, and this is, I guess, due to Alexander, uh, 1923. So it's been around for a while. Uh, every uh, closed-oriented three-manifold uh, has an open book decomposition. Okay. So what I'd like to do is, I'm not going to you know, give a detailed proof of this, but I'm actually going to sketch two. There's actually three proofs I'd like to sketch, but I think there's no chance of me doing that in the time allotted and get on with anything else I'd like to say. But um, I think seeing a couple different proofs is actually quite useful. Um, it's also useful in applications. So let's sketch two proofs of this theorem. So. Uh, the first one, first proof. So this proof, I think, is the one that was actually originally due to Alexander. Um, and it's the one that's probably most commonly cited when people prove this theorem. So to pr- for this proof, we actually need two facts, which I'm not going to bother to prove. Um, so fact one, uh, also due to Alexander, is that uh, every 
three manifold. By the way, when I say every three manifold, as I said, that means every closed oriented three manifold. I'm always talking about closed oriented three manifolds here. Just want to save a little bit of chalk. So, so every uh, three manifold M uh, is a branched cover of S3 over some link L sub M. So I'll denote the link L sub M. Actually, this link is not unique. There's actually lots and lots of different links that you can branch to get M, but um, I'll pick one and I'll label it L sub M just so we can talk about it later on. So we need one more fact that also coincidentally is due to Alexander. So fact two. Is that every link L in S3 can be braided about the unknot. So what do I mean by uh, can be braided about the unknot? What I mean by this, so i.e., well, by this I mean by this, we mean, uh, let's see, uh, set S1 cross D2 equal to S3 minus a neighborhood of uh, the unknot. So U again is going to be the unknot. So you take a neighborhood of the unknot, remove it from S3, I'm going to get an S1 cross uh, cross D2, and we can isotop, we can isotop uh, L so that L is contained in S1 cross D2 and L intersects point cross D2 transversely for all uh, for all uh, points in S1. Okay? That's what I mean by braiding, uh, by braiding a link about the unknot. Okay, so once we have these two facts, and again, I'm not going to try to justify why these facts are true, but once we have them, it's very easy to prove that any uh, three-manifold has an open book decomposition, and that's just as follows. So uh, given M uh, and LM contained in S3 as above, okay, so just uh, LM again is this link uh, that we can branch over to get, uh, to get M. Uh, let P from M to S3 be the branch cover map. So braid, maybe I should have done this first, but braid LM about U and let uh, B equal P inverse of U. So just take the inverse image of the unknot under this uh, branch covering map, and you'll get some knot or link up in M. And uh, so this contained in M is binding of the open book, of an open book. And the vibration of the complement is quite simple. Um, if you just take M minus B, um, the map to S1 is simply, uh, well, first of all, you project from M down to S3, and then you compose with this map pi sub U. Remember, pi sub U was the vibration of the complement of the unknot. That was the thing I defined back in one of the, the previous examples. So this is the vibration of complement. of U, okay? So, 
So it's kind of easy to see what's going on here. The idea is down here in S3, we've got this map P up to M. So down in S3, um, the complement of the unknot is kind of a solid torus. And in the solid torus, you have these disks. The, uh, the link L intersects these disks in a bunch of points. So the red is uh, LM intersect uh, D, uh, point cross, point cross uh, D2. Um, and then up, upstairs, um, the complement of B, um, you're actually going to have some surface. And this surface is going to be kind of a branch cover of this disk. So for every disk, you have the branch cover, which gives you a surface. So you get this family of surfaces that kind of goes around um, the knot upstairs. OK, so that's kind of the picture you see. So that's kind of the end of the first proof. And let me give you uh, the second proof now. Here we need uh, the following fact, uh, which is due to licorice in 62 and Wallace in 60, um, that every uh, closed, oriented, three manifold uh, may be obtained by surgery, by plus or minus one surgery on a link, which I'll also denote, denote LM. But of course, it's a different link uh, in S3. Um, so link LM of unknots. So all, these, uh, all the components, each component of this link is an unknot itself, but they're linked together in some possibly complicated way. And I should actually say, if you examine their proof a little bit more, you can actually say, moreover, um, moreover, each component, well, moreover, LM can be, how do I want to say this, um, moreover, there exists an unknot U such that each component of LM uh, links U trivially, or one time trivially, one time. <coughs> so when I say trivially one time, I mean if this is our unknot U, um, each component looks exactly like that. Okay? So the link itself is very complicated running through here, but each component does something like that. So I'm not sure if this moreover part actually follows from uh, Wallace's proof, because I haven't actually looked at that. But, um, but I know this moreover. If you look at Licorice's proof, it's very easy to prove the second statement. Um, OK, so now, so uh, to let u i u be open book. No. open book of S3. So we have this open book of S3. And uh, here's, say, U. And a page of the open book is, say, just that disk spanning across there. And of course, these disks kind of fill out the rest of S3. And each component of L kind of pierces this page. Or we can at least isotop it so it pierces this page once. So this is um, uh, a component. of LM. And actually, maybe I should just use a different color because I want to make sure that it's clear that this is going to be a different component. (coughs) 
So a different component. Anyway. And you might have lots of other components too. <coughs> so when we do plus or minus one surgery to a component K of LM, you see the boundary of a neighborhood of K uh, intersect the page uh, sits inside a neighborhood of K after surgery. And the picture is the following. Uh, so this is so this is the neighborhood of K. And after the surgery, the page intersecting the boundary of this neighborhood is going to look exactly like this or or that. That's what it means to do plus or minus one surgery is that when you kind of pull uh, this, this meridional, th see this page intersects these things in meridians and if you kind of pull them back into the surgery torus after surgery, they kind of run around like this. And the thing to notice, of course, is that um, so each of these is uh, diffeomorphic to to something like this. So the boundary of the fiber kind of sits on uh, the boundary of the solid torus like a longitude. I mean, it's a longitude that's been twisted a little bit, but it's still a longitude, which means you can kind of extend it down to the core of the solid torus, which uh, means, of course, that if you remove the cores of the solid torus, the complement of the solid torus fibers by these annuli, and then once you get outside the solid tori, the rest of it fibers by those disks. So you actually see there's an open book um, for the thing after surgery. Um, and I'd just like to note, so note, this gives an open book with uh, planar leaves. So by planar leaves, I mean each leaf um, is a planar surface, which means it's some multiply punctured disk or a disk with a lot of subdisks removed. Okay. Okay, like I said, there's other proofs of this theorem, um, and they're actually kind of interesting in themselves, uh, but we should probably move on because we've got to really understand this, uh, like I said, we want to understand not only open books, but also this process of stabilization I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. So let's see. So definition, uh, two abstract or given two abstract open books. sigma i phi i, i equals zero and one. Let c i be an arc properly embedded in sigma i uh, and r i a rectangular neighborhood of uh, CI in sigma I. So the picture here is, so here's a little piece of sigma I and we take an arc, we take an arc running from one boundary component to the other, CI. Actually it can be the same boundary component, I don't really care, it's just some arc running from boundary to boundary. And then the rectangular neighborhood is just something like this. This is R i. 
And we can think of Ri as Ci cross minus 1, 1. Okay. Okay, so the Murasugi sum of sigma 0 phi 0 and sigma 1 phi 1 is the open book, which I'll denote sigma 0 phi 0 star sigma 1 phi 1 with page with page uh, sigma 1 star sorry sigma 0 star sigma 1 uh, which is equal to sigma 1 union r1 equals r2 sigma 2 and you do this union in such a way that you actually have a surface and what does that mean to actually have a surface um, you uh, identify r1 with r2 Sorry, R, sorry, I've shifted notation, sorry about this. So it's a 0 and 1, 0 and 1, 0 and 1. Uh, with R2 as, as follows. So if this is a sigma 1, sorry, sigma 0, then uh, C0 runs across like that. And if this is sigma 1, then C1 runs across like that. So it's kind of the only way you can do that identification so you actually get a surface in the end, okay? So in fact, this is essentially kind of a plumbing operation. You kind of just reverse the... the uh, the factors in the product structure and kind of identify. Okay, so this is uh, what the page is, so and monodromy uh, phi 1, phi 0 composed with, composed with phi 1. So what does this mean? Well, phi 0, remember phi 0 is a diffeomorphism of sigma 0 that's identity near the boundary. Since the identity near the boundary, we can extend it across sigma 2 just to the identity on all of sigma 2. And that gives me, that way I can think of phi zero as a diffeomorphism of this uh, sigma zero star sigma one. And now we just do the same thing with sigma one to get a diffeomorphism of this sigma zero star sigma one. And this gives me my monodromy map, okay? So what's the big deal about Murasugi sum? By the way, um, another thing is this has become a fairly standard abuse of notation now, at least in contact geometry. Uh, the Murasugi sum is actually something much more general than this. This plumbing construction was known before him, and he kind of generalized it. But for some reason, uh, people tend to call just this plumbing construction, at least when talking about contact structures, the Murasugi sum. And I'll kind of stick with that convention. But I, I should point out the Murasugi sum is actually much more general than this. OK. So you have theorem. 3 due to goodbye uh, and 83 uh, that if you take the 3 manifold associated to sigma to this open book, this abstract open book, and you take the 3 manifold associated to this open book and you take their connected sum, then what you get is the three manifold associated to the Murasugi sum? Oh, sorry. To the Murasugi sum. Okay. So, kind of Murasugi summing of the abstract open books corresponds to connected summing of the ambient of the ambient three manifolds. Okay. Excuse me. Yes. Yes, it does. You mean it's not in the P1 first that is between the other that's in the back? It actually doesn't matter.
Okay, so let me, uh, actually I should probably say sketch. So again, I don't think we'll be able to kind of go through every detail, especially in the time we have left. But um, let me just kind of draw one picture. And I think this one picture essentially explains the proof. Um, so the idea is, um, how are we supposed to construct this manifold? We're supposed to take sigma zero across the interval and then identify front and back with, uh, with phi zero. So let me, well, let me just let B i equal r, uh, sorry, B zero, r zero across zero one half sitting inside of uh, sigma zero cross zero one and B one equals r one cross one half one sitting inside of sigma one cross zero one. So B i is a ball, which we can think of it as being a ball in uh, M sigma i phi i, right? So it's a ball sitting inside of here, but once I glue everything up and put in the binding, it's a ball inside of, uh, inside of the abstract manifold. These are the balls I'm going to use to do the connected summing operation. So what I want to tell you how to do is kind of stick these two pieces together. If I take these things and remove those balls from them, I'm going to tell you how to put them together, um, and then I'm going to kind of leave the rest of it as kind of an exercise to, to kind of figure out. So the picture now is, So this is a little piece of, say, sigma zero. This, this kind of shaded bit is sigma zero. Um, and this is kind of sigma zero cross zero. And notice I've kind of taken a little chunk out. What I've taken out here, this is the ball B zero. Okay, so I've kind of, so sigma zero uh, cross zero up to sigma zero cross uh, one half, got this little interval, this little rectangle taken out of it. Um, and then you have the rest of the, of the um, sigma zero cross zero one. Um, now let me draw the other one like this. Uh. So this is the same thing that kind of turned on its side. So this is, for instance, sigma, this back face here is sigma one cross zero, and this front face is sigma one cross one. And so you see you have these two things and they've got these notches put in them. So I don't know if you ever, as a child, played with like Lincoln Logs, but you have these two notches and if you kind of put one on top of the other, you can kind of fit them together. And that's exactly what we're going to do is we're going to kind of pick this up and slide it in so this kind of notch goes back through there um, and you'll get something so... Uh, you'll get something that kind of looks like this. Uh, maybe... I shouldn't try to draw the whole thing in, but you get something that looks more or less like that. Um, and this is actually uh, sigma zero star sigma one cross zero one. Okay. And now, just in words, just because uh, we're running a little short of time here, how do you, how do you think about gluing this together and taking the, getting the mapping torus over here? What you do is you think about, instead of gluing the front to the back using the monodromy map, it's equivalent to glue the, glue the front to the back using the identity map but then take a surface in the middle here somewhere that's kind of past this hole that you made and kind of cutting along that and then re-gluing by the monodromy map. That actually gives you the same thing. And you can do the same thing over here. And if you think about that a little bit, that's going to tell you how to actually kind of uh, see that if you take the mapping torus of this and the mapping torus of this, remove those two balls, um, you'll get the mapping torus of this once you glue them together. Okay? Um, again, it's one of these things that you just kind of have to stare at for a little while, but I mean, I hope I've, I've given you the main ideas to look at here, but the exercise Think about this, about the picture, uh, uh, and the binding. Notice I've completely ignored the binding in this, uh, in this story, but it's not too hard to work the binding in once you understand what happens on the mapping torus level. So again, that's another hint, is only think about the mapping tori first. Once you understand that, put in the binding and uh, that'll take care of everything. So that's kind of the end of the sketch. <clears throat> so we need another definition. 
And this is finally going to be the last thing we need to actually understand the right-hand side of that theorem, of that correspondence I wrote down at the beginning of the talk. So a positive, uh, respectively negative, stabilization oops, uh, of an abstract open book, sigma phi is um, obtained by 1. Well, the page is going to be sigma 1, is going to be sigma union of one handle. So what I've done is I had some surface sigma before. I only have one boundary component here, but this is my sigma, my sigma prime. I'm just going to add a little one handle onto one of the boundary components. I don't care which, just some boundary component. Um, and two, the new monodromy, phi prime, is going to be phi composed with tau sub c, where tau sub c is a Dane twist about a curve C in sigma prime such that such that uh, C intersects the co-core of uh, the one handle once. So the picture is the curve C. So remember the co-core of a one handle is simply that arc there, and I just want to take any curve that intersects it once, and then after that I can do anything it wants. Something like that, maybe. I don't care what it does, but it just has to intersect the co-core once. Uh, okay. So, so we denote the stabilization as S A plus minus uh, sigma phi, uh, where A uh, is equal to C intersect sigma. So A is the arc that kind of runs around sigma, um, but not around the one handle, because it's supposed to sit on the original surface. Um, so I'm denoting the arc here. Sometimes I'll leave that off, and the plus minus depends on a positive or negative stabilization. Um, and exercise. A fairly easy exercise, but a very good one to work out. Show um, S A plus of sigma phi is diffeomorphic to um, sigma phi Murasugi sum with H plus. Well, actually, maybe we'll put plus minus uh, phi uh, so pi plus minus. Um, well. Minus. So what, remember what this is, this is the, uh, the positive and negative hop flink and the vibration of the complement of the positive and negative uh, hop flink. Um, these are supposed to be abstract open books, so you should actually take you know, the abstract open book associated with this. And if you do the Murasugi sum, that's equivalent to doing the positive and negative stabilization. So of course, an immediate corollary of this is that, um, that the manifold associated with the positive or negative stabilization of sigma phi is just equal to the manifold associated with sigma phi. Right, because you're going to connect sum with the manifold corresponding to this. And what was that? It was a three-sphere. So it doesn't actually change the manifold. So that's a very important fact. Um, okay, so let me just end with a couple more exercises to kind of understand these ideas a little bit better and also be able to construct a lot more open books. So exercise. So use uh, the above to find open book, abstract open books. Corresponding to um, to uh, write uh, to uh, well, let me just draw the pictures instead of giving the words. Um, Uh, 
that didn't go so well. Um, it's a little better. So all of these, not, all of these links, the uh, right and left-handed trefoil and the figure eight knot, all of them are fibered. And you can actually draw the vibrations by thinking about this Murasugi summing operation in, in S3. Um, to show every three manifold has uh, an open book with connected binding. I think this is actually due to Meyer originally, but uh, from what we've done so far, it's actually very easy to prove this now. Um, and lastly, um, just to kind of have some fun to show there's a really nice, interesting little topological application of all the stuff we've been talking about, um, prove a theorem of Bing. You can prove any one you want, but I'll give you one that's probably best to do with open books. Um, a closed three-manifold oriented three-manifold is S3 if and only if uh, every, uh, every simple closed curve uh, is contained, uh, is contained in a ball. Okay, so if every simple closed curve sits inside of a three ball, then the manifold must be S3. And if it's S3, then that actually happens to be true as well. So like I said, it's a very nice application of this, uh, this open book stuff. And the hint is uh, the only, um, every surface bundle over the circle is irreducible except for one whose fiber is S2. So that's the hint. And I'll quit there and we'll pick up with contact structures and relate them to these open books uh, next time. Questions? Oh, the hint is the fact that um, a surface bundle over the circle is irreducible unless the fiber is, uh, is, a, is an S2. And you should prove that too, I guess. Why not? Not too hard.